All right, hello everyone. Welcome to OT with DA and DC for the last, this is the last episode of DC. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, I see, I see the lip sticking out there. Um, and today is day 16. Is that right? What chapter are we I in? I never remember. We're, we're I, so I, I get confused. I honestly uh, do. 16. Yeah, 16. so today's day 16. 16. We're in chapter 15. So welcome everybody. We are so glad that you are tuning in. Uh, we're going to be in a really great chapter today. And as I said in my Instagram post and in Facebook and in Twitter, in many ways, uh, today's chapter is like a breath of fresh air and sunshine. Sunshine's actually an important word. Did you pick that up? Yeah. It, very interesting because we had darkness yesterday mm -hmm. in our chapter titled The Destruction of Sodom. And then today in the marriage of Isaac, it is a ray of sunshine. And uh, I'm looking forward to this. Welcome, everybody. So glad you're here. Uh, if you're just signing on now, as I said, we still have D. Casper with us for uh, one. This is the last, last night. night. Last this dance. is it. And uh, I've got other guests lined up, though. Uh, Nathan Renner, Ty Gibson. Uh, let's see. Who am I forgetting? Elise Harbolt, Sylvia Bakioki, um, And I'm forgetting some others. But anyway, it's going to be great. Oh, Johnny Suarez, Hannah Suarez. Going to be absolutely wonderful. And I'm still trying to convince Violetta to do at least one episode with me. So join me in prayer that Violetta will acquiesce and uh, come on at least one. Oh, here's a, I have a little surprise. It might not work out, so I'm not going to say anything about it. But I've, I've got one guest lined up that if I can persuade them, you will be very blessed. I mean, you're blessed with all the guests, but if I can pull this one off, it'll be big time, big time. So day 16, chapter 15. Uh, just a reminder to use the OT with DA hashtag. Once again, I've got to give a, br a big shout out to those of you that are putting up some incredible oh, artwork. Showed I showed some of it to D today. Those I are mean, amazing. You guys are amazing. God bless you. Really good. Really, really good. And uh, anyway, we're going to get started with prayer. Even though this is a short chapter, there's a lot going on here. And what I want to do, D, I don't always do this, but I'm going to read through uh, not, maybe not the whole of Genesis 24, but a large section of Genesis 24, yeah. just to give us a feel for the, the shape of the chapter, where we're going. So welcome, everybody. We're so glad you're here. And uh, we think we have figured out the phone thing so that by the grace of God, the sound will never drop out again. We've, we've done all of the possible yes. things that can be done. So um, let's see, somebody's saying, you own the chocolate lab from DA with DA. That's my dog. <laughs> That's my son. That's my firstborn. <laughs> Yeah, he does have a he does have a dog. His name is Buddy, the greatest dog in the history of four legged mammals. I do have to say yes. that's an extremely unoriginal name. Like the best you could do is Buddy. There's a story behind it. It the, better be a very good story it because is. it okay. will make you. Well, I don't know if you'll cry, but people cry when I tell the story generally. Okay, it's a good right. one. Well, you can tell me later. <laughs> All right, hello everybody. We're so glad you're here. Let's see, D A and V A sounds impressive, doesn't it? That's what yes. I'm talking about. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. All right, so we're going to start with prayer, and then we're going to get right into this. Um, Dee, why don't you start us off, and then okay. we'll get into Genesis chapter 24. Oh, sweet Jesus, thank you for this chance to study, to grow, to learn, and to just fellowship over such mm. a beautiful chapter. Speak to us and grow us through what we learn today, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so our chapter is titled, The Marriage of Isaac, and in many ways, it represents a marked contrast to the chapter that we were in yesterday, and there will be several opportunities today yeah. to highlight points of contrast with yesterday's chapter. And other previous chapters. And previous chapters as well. Yeah, Good. she draws from a lot of them. By the way, you should know that that D and I stayed up till almost 3 in the morning last night talking. 2.30. 2.30 in the morning. Yeah. And uh, We solved all the world's problems. You yeah, the world's the problems off. are officially solved, so I don't know what Take problems you think you're facing, um, but you're not facing them anymore <laughs> because we figured it out. We fixed it. Um, but I actually slept in till like 9.30, so I got a full seven hours, but D... I woke up at 6 a.m. Woke up at 6 a.m. So you went to bed at 2.30, Yeah. woke up at 6 a.m. I'm running a school and putting out fires. How do you feel and right now? And my dog ran away, and there was nothing I could do. The door opened, and he ran outside and was playing in the neighborhood. It was just a mess, so... How do you feel? What's your tired level 1 to 10 right now? I feel amazing. Okay. I, I went Great. for a long walk well, this morning, funny. did the rowing machine, and I took a nap this afternoon. I feel like a million bucks. My latest food was good. Oh, let me tell Woo! you, just briefly, I'm sorry to do this to you, but just briefly, we just had a meal. This was the meal we just had. It was an Indian meal, and we had uh, brown rice with dal, and then we had uh, Bombay potatoes, 
yeah. baked cauliflower, mm. uh, great big beautiful salad, mm. homemade bread, homemade cookies, homemade donuts. It's true. Homemade donuts. Yeah. In fact, the maker of the bread and the maker of the cookies and the maker of the donuts, they're in this room right now. Absolutely. Can you guess where they are? <laughs> they're behind the camera. <laughs> So uh, you sometimes hear me, I'll say, that's my doctor. So anyway, my, my, my doctor is in the room here tonight. There's not enough space to put him in here, but he's right over there. And uh, his lovely girlfriend slash wife of, how long have you guys been married? 42 years of marital bliss. <laughs> 42 40 years. years of marital bliss <laughs> sitting just it. over there. So uh, time, to time, to, at, at time to time tonight, I might call on you guys and ask you for answers. And I would prefer if you'd give correct answers. <laughs> <laughs> Can you agree to that? <laughs> Please give them in the form of a question. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so here we go. Um, Genesis chapter 24 is a long, long chapter. Let's look at it. It's like 70 verses almost. Yo. So I won't read the whole thing, but I do want to read some of it. It's a beautiful, beautiful chapter, and I'm going to kind of race through this um, just to give us, again, a feel for the shape of it. I'm going to read from the NIV here. Here we go. Abraham was now very old, and the Lord had blessed him in every way. Mm. I really like that. Yeah. The Lord had blessed him in every way. He said to the senior servant in his household, the one in charge of all that he had, put your hand under my thigh. I want you to swear to the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not get a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I am living, but will go to my country and my own relatives and get a wife for my son Isaac. The servant asked him, what if the woman is unwilling to come back with me to this land? Shall I then take your son back to the country you came from? Make sure that you do not take my son back there, Abraham said. The Lord, the God of heaven, who brought me out of my father's household and my native land and who spoke to me and promised me an oath saying, to your offspring, I will give this land. He will send his angel before you so that you can get a wife from my son from there. If the woman is unwilling to come back with you, then you are released from this oath of mine. Only do not take my son back there. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of his master, Abraham, and swore an oath to him concerning this matter. I guess that was a thing. Yeah. That was like a customary thing. It if happens you, later, too. If you were really serious about what you were promising, um, you, you put the hand under the old thigh. We'll sometimes say that among my friends. I'll say, <laughs> uh, hey, put your hand under my thigh if you really mean what you're saying. And we all have a good laugh. Okay, verse 10. Then the servant left, taking with him 10 of his master's camels, loaded with all kinds of good things from his master. He set out for Aram nah Naharaim and made his way to the town of Nahor. He had the camels kneel down near the well outside the town, and it was toward evening, the time that the women go out to draw water. Then he prayed, Lord, God of my master Abraham, make me successful today and show kindness to my master Abraham. Look. I am standing beside this spring and the daughters of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. May it be when I say to a young woman, please let down your jar that I may have a drink. And she says, drink, and I will water your camels too. Let her be the one you have chosen for your servant, Isaac. Beautiful. By this, I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. Before he had finished praying, Rebecca came out with her jar on her shoulder. She was the daughter of Bethuel, son of Milcah, who was the wife of Abram's brother Nahor. The woman was very beautiful, a virgin. No man had ever slept with her. She went down to the spring, filled her jar, and came up again. The servant hurried to meet her and said, please give me a little water from your jar. Drink, my lord, she said, and quickly lowered the jar to her hands and give, gave him a drink. After she had given him a drink, she said, I'll draw water for your camels too until they have had enough to drink. Hmm. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough, ran back to the well to draw more water, and drew enough for all his camels. Without saying a word, the man watched her closely to learn whether or not the Lord had made his journey successful. When the camels had finished drinking, the man took out a golden nose ring weighing a becca or a becca, and two gold bracelets weighing 10 shekels. Then he asked, whose daughter are you? Please tell me, is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? She answered him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, bore to Nahor. And she added, we have plenty of straw and fodder as well as room for you to spend the night. Then the man bowed down and worshiped the Lord, saying, praise be to the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not abandoned his kindness and faithfulness to my master. As for me, the Lord has led me on the journey to the house of my master's relatives. I'm going to keep reading. It's too good. Can I keep going? You can't stop a love story halfway through. <laughs> 
<laughs> then the young woman ran and told her mother's household about these things. Now, Rebecca had a brother named Laban, and he hurried out to the man and at the spring. And as soon as he had seen the nose ring and the bracelets on his sister's arms and had heard Rebecca tell what the man had said to her, he went out to the man and found him standing by the camels near the spring. Come, you who are blessed by the Lord, he said. Why are you standing out here? I have prepared the house and the place for the camels. So the man went to the house and the camels were unloaded. Straw and fodder were brought for the camels and water for him and his, and his men to wash their feet. Then food was set before them, but he said, I will not eat until I have told you what it is that I have to say. Then tell us, Laban said, and I'll probably just stop right there. Maybe we'll refer back to some of this, but they go inside and he, he relays the, the reason for his visit, which is my, my master Abraham has sent me to find a daughter for his son, Isaac. A wife. Uh, excuse me, a wife. Excuse me. Thank you for correcting me there. And uh, I want to know if this is the place. Uh, I prayed and he tells the whole story and he said, let me know if I'm in the right place and if you see any providence in any of this. If you don't, then I'll leave, and I don't know if I should go to the right or the left. And then this really beautiful story unfolds. Great. What, what? Laban is sus. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. So it's a beautiful, beautiful love story, very much unlike modern love stories. Yeah. Right? Like, if you were ever over at somebody's house, and you were eating, and it was just a couple that you were getting to know, and you said, so tell me how you met one another. <laughs> Uh, very unlikely that the story bears any resemblance to this. Well, you know, it didn't my, involve camels. Yeah. Didn't involve camels or, you know, hands under thighs or, you know, bracelets and yeah. nose rings and unlikely. Yeah. Unlikely. But still a beautiful love story. And one that, one of my favorite parts about the story, and, and Dee, I just want to say this by way of introduction. I want to hear your sort of overarching thoughts. Then we'll get into the chapter itself. One, I was struck by two things in this, in this story. Number one is how formal everything is. Mm. There's just this really, dare I say, beautiful formality. And I know we live in a time and in, in an age now where there's just, a, things are casual, mm -hmm. very sort of, um, you know, dressed down and easy and people like it that way. But I think there's a case to be made for some level of formality, especially when really important things are happening. Things like oaths and marriages. Mm -hmm. and, and I like that. So that was the first thing that sort of jumped out to me. And the second thing is just how trusting Isaac is of his father's wisdom, his father's advice, his father's connection with God. And I, I was just like, this is such a beautiful, wholesome story. Yeah. And personally, I like the formality of it. What yeah. were sort of your umbrella, you know, uh, over the top thoughts? You know, I, I love that. And just the way that the picture's painted, you know, Ellen White gives some more information. She uses lots of I don't know if it's adjectives is the right word, but lots of ways to explain kind of the character traits of Rebecca. Descriptors, adjectives, yeah. yep. They yep. just made her, just the way in which it's communicated, what type of person she was. Yeah, very much so. It reminded me of the language that's used about Abraham whenever it says Abraham and Canaan mm -hmm. in that chapter. Yeah. Um, you know, that she's the dude S. I don't know, but just the way in which they communicate her, I just really appreciated Um had that, I mean, the dude won the lottery. Like he yeah, just trusted no, God right. to take care of business and he won the lottery with what he got back. Yeah, yeah, one of the things I really like in the Types and Symbols journal that I'm reading and studying out of here, these are amazing. I like the, the, the little intros, the sort of trailer version. And this one in particular, I thought was very well written. Mm -hmm. It says, not trusting the future of his family to chance, Abraham sends his oath sworn servant on a mission to find a partner for Isaac. The resulting match is made through prayer, gracious generosity, and I like this, Yeah, and a daring trust in God, mm -hmm. which culminates in a happy marriage for Isaac and Rebecca. And I love that language. Mm -hmm. I, I want to have a daring yeah. trust in God. Yeah. So absolutely beautiful. Um, okay, are we ready? Ready to get into the chapter? Yeah. So on the very first page, I'm trying to decide what to do with my other Bible here. I'll set it here. On the, on the very first page, so we're in 206 of the types and symbols, 171, 172 of the uh, original. And one of the first things that popped out to me, Dee, and, and then I'll defer you and you can sort of talk to us about these first two pages. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that. Yeah, yeah. I really yeah. love this about midway through the first paragraph, this Abraham's habitual faith in God. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you've ever heard of the title of this book by Eugene Peterson. It is a, it's a really cool book on the Songs of Ascent, a series of psalms that, that he writes about and he sort of exposits. And the title of that book is A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. Hmm. And I want you just to hear how cool that is. 
What a great title, a long <laughs> obedience in the same direction. And that's really what our life is. That's mm -hmm. the life of faith. And here we come to the, you know, toward the end of Abraham's life. And she uses the phrase, Abraham's habitual faith in God. And I immediately thought of that Eugene Peterson book title. Mm. A long, Abraham's life has been a life of a long obedience, always in the same direction. Yeah. I like that. I what like, jumped out to you? So this first paragraph, she's basically picking up from where she left off in the previous chapter. It's another statement of contrast, the idea of that the bad influences that Lot was around in Sodom. That was last night, right? Yeah, that was last okay. night. Yeah, I haven't slept since then. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's been one long day. Yeah. A long day in the same direction. Right. Uh, so, but she makes this point that the patriarch feared the effect of the corrupting influences surrounding his son. Yeah. So Abraham is so concerned about what this influence can do, and he's not going to be here forever. Right. Good point. And, and he wants someone that's going to lead him in the same direction that dad has pointed him in. Yeah. And that's a big, and so if united with one who did not fear God, he'd be in danger of sacrificing principle for the sake of harmony. Yeah. So I just want to keep peace in the home so I may water down my own experience. And then she shows a contrast in that later about Lot's wife, later Correct. in the chapter. Um, and not just Lot's wife, but the contrast with Lot's wife and then also the wives of Ishmael. Yes, that's that, right. That they that's were right. idolatrous and yeah. they tended to steer him away from Yahweh. Yeah. And the same with Lot's wife. Yeah. And so this is in marked contrast to that. Absolutely. And so the last sentence of that first paragraph, in the mind of Abraham, the choice of a wife for his son was a matter of grave importance. Mm. And he was anxious to have a merry one who would not lead him from God. That's the punchline. And so like it, it's it's a it's a it's a consuming thing for him. He's really anxious about it. And that's why he, this whole oath comes down, you know, like I, I need you to yeah. swear to me that you're gonna do this the right way. I, I why do you think he didn't travel himself? It must be because mm -hmm. he's old, it was a long trip. And I mean, or I maybe know. he just had, maybe he was still had so many managerial responsibilities. Yeah. I mean, it's a good question. I don't know if it's like to have objectivity and to let God lead instead of like dad trying to, okay. you know, kind okay, of. Okay, gotcha. I, I don't know. It's a good question. One of the, the next paragraph then goes into detail and a little bit of detail talking about in ancient times, how, how these arranged, what we sometimes yeah. call arranged marriages were sort of the order of the day. And that strikes our modern sensibilities as decidedly you know, impossible, really, yeah. an arranged marriage. Yeah. But but actually, the, the truth of the matter is there's something, well, well, I'm not suggesting that we go back to anything analogous to formally arranged marriages. There is something really beautiful in the idea that families are getting together and making decisions about what's in the best interest in the, in the welfare, for the welfare of their children. Yeah. It's not just a capricious decision. It's not an yeah. impulsive decision. It certainly isn't a decision that's built primarily around physical attraction and lust. It's a reasoned partnership between not just two people, but between two families. Mm -hmm. And I think Christian marriages at their best are something like that. Mm. I tell people all the time, you don't just marry a person, you marry a family, yeah. right? You're, you are marrying into a tribe, into a clan, mm -hmm. into a culture. And I, I, I like that. I like yeah. that sort of old fashioned formality again. And and she knows that there's going to be pushback about this idea, and she makes this really helpful point at the top of page 207. None were required to marry those whom they could not love. Correct. That There was this sense of protection in this process. It wasn't yeah. just like, ah, oh, you're stuck with them, like it or not. Like, mm -hmm. no. You, and, and she says in another place, I think it's Adventist home, it'd be a sin to marry somebody you don't love. And, and you can yeah. see even in the narrative itself that, that Rebecca is given the final, and we'll get to this in a second, yeah. but Rebecca gets to make the final decision about whether or not to go. So this was not this, as it sometimes painted, this oppressive patriarchy where the males have all the power, all the position, and the and the women are just moved around like you know pieces on a on a chessboard or something. Yeah. Not at all. In fact, one of the things that we'll get to a little bit later in the program is I'll walk through seven textual indicators that Rebecca was a formidable capable, intelligent person. Mm -hmm. And the narrative presents her very mm -hmm. much that way. And so this was an arrangement that was really, at least in the case of Abraham and Isaac, it was left up to God. Yeah, and, and it says that in the next paragraph. Correct. It says that he trusted his father's wisdom and his affection, that his dad wanted him to be happy and blessed. Yes. And was satisfied to commit the matter to him. He yeah. trusted him in this. I love it. And then it says, believing also that God himself would direct in the Beautiful. choice. That's made. the punchline. And so I know that if my dad and God both value my happiness, 
the decision that comes out of this is going to lead to me flourishing Correct. and being happy. And Abraham is so confident yeah. that this is how it's going to go, that he literally says to Eliezer, and it's, it's quite formal. He's like, listen, the God that called me out of the land of my yeah. fathers, the God that did this and this and made an oath, and that God will he send his will angel and you. it's going to happen. Yeah. And I, I think that, yes, there needs to be, you know, we sometimes say chemistry and there needs to be a connection. Yes, and yes, and yes, and yes. But really one of the major themes that emerges in this chapter is that God is the one who yeah. should be writing our love story. Yeah. We should be turning every aspect of our lives over to God, including but not limited to the selection of a life partner. Mm -hmm. and, because that's going to determine who our children are, who our grandchildren are. I mean, this is such a seemingly personal decision, but it's a decision that has reverberating, literally eternal reverberations. And it has missional consequences and many other yes. things. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely love that. So here's how I wrote this in my journal. I wrote that that Isaac trusted both his life and his wife mm. to his godly father, Abraham. I mean, yeah. he's already trusted his life That's to right. him back in That's Genesis right. 22. Yeah. So if, if this is the kind of father that you could trust your life to and you could trust his connection with God, right. well, then surely you can trust him to select a partner for you. Mm. Because remember, this is not just a Hollywood romantic relationship. Isaac's going to get all of the, the encampment, the... The, the servants, yeah. the employees, the, the the goods, the tents. The family business. Yeah. This is a this is yeah. a, a big decision. Yeah. And so he says, well, I trust my dad. Yeah. And I love it. I love yeah. it. I have two sons, 119, 120. And I'm very much hoping and praying, and we'll get down to this in the uh in the rubric, that my sons will take under serious advisement the uh desires of my wife and myself. And it doesn't mean that we're going to control, but we would definitely like to play a contributing role in the decisions. I mean, we got a lot of skin in the game with these kids. Yeah. You know, we yeah. want to see them make good decisions. They want to make good decisions. And so I always get a little nervous when well-meaning, but ultimately infatuated Christian young people mm -hmm. just make decisions, impulsive decisions, quite independent of godly parents. Yeah. Or any village for that matter. Right. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I'm not talking about overbearing parents right. here or controlling parents. We'll, we'll get into that a little bit more later. Now, one more thing here. I'm, I'm still on this page one, uh, 207. And I just really like this language. This is uh, almost at the end of the chapter, uh, the paragraph, excuse me, that begins Isaac trusting to mm -hmm. his fathers. All the way down. Listen to this. The patriarch encouraged him, that is Eliezer, in his difficult and yeah. delicate undertaking. Yeah. I mean, that perfectly captures this. I mean, just yes. think of the responsibility that's on you. Yeah, the, the whole of, of your master's future empire and yeah. his future family and all of the children and grandchildren. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. all that's at stake here. Yeah, no problem. Don't yeah. blow it. It's okay. not like, hey, run no. down to the store and you know pick us up some groceries and, <laughs> and don't forget the ketchup. No, this is like everything yeah. is in your hands. And I just like the fact she calls it a delicate or a difficult and delicate undertaking. And you're sworn to an oath. Like right. it's, There's a lot of weight there. Okay, I'm turning the page. You got anything more on that page? On, on the bottom, he says it was a time of anxious thought with him, obviously. Of course, how said. could it not be? Um, not only to his important results, not only to his master's household, then the next page, uh, 208 at the top, um, but to future generations. That's right. Might follow from the choice he made. And how was he to choose wisely among entire strangers? Like, it's not even like you can talk into the network and yeah. say, you got any recommendations? Like, this is... That's right. He, I mean, we have yeah. no evidence that Eliezer's even been to this place. Right. Maybe he had. Maybe these people were at some level familiar to him. But but here's what I really like, and tell me if you detected this, Steve. So the question is sort of raised there. Um, how would he decide? How would he know? Yeah. And this is so serendipitous, providential. Yeah. He thinks, well, I know. And he reverts back to this theme that we've seen again and again with Abraham. He says, hospitality. Yes, and, and it just comes into his mind as an impress from the Spirit, courteousness, hospitality, kindness. kindness. Yeah. Um, that will be my indicator. And so he prays earnestly mm -hmm. that there will be some indication, specific indication, having to do with hospitality. And mm -hmm. I just think that's so cool that that was like his default. Yeah, like I, it, he wanted it to be, I think I mentioned this earlier, um, I didn't mention this earlier. I wrote it in my notes earlier. Yeah, yeah, go. Um, he's, the servant looked for a woman who would fit into the culture of Abraham's home. Exactly. Like he's looking for somebody that would fit in the family. And what's the, the first thing designed. that comes to his mind? Hospitality. Hospitality. Yeah, kindness. Right? Like 
Who has an open heart? Who's who's looking out for others? Who yeah. wants to be a blessing? Who, yeah. like Abraham, will see three you know wayfaring strangers walking mm-hmm. across the desert and think, whoa, whoa there, hey, there's a situation I can help. Yeah. There's people that I want to meet. There's people that I want to get to know. That's so cool. Yeah. It's awesome that the default position that's sort of in his mind about his master's home is, oh, well, this is a warm, mm-hmm. open, happy, loving, and this word will become important for us later in the chapter, sunshiny home. Yeah. I like that. I think yeah. that's really, really great. Um, so then she comes out and this hospitality element is on full display. And this is where we are alerted to the fact that Moses is telling this story in a very specific way. And Dee already alluded to this, that Rebecca in many ways, and hear me out on this, the way that Moses is telling the story is that Rebecca in many ways mirrors the very faithfulness and hospitality yeah. of Abraham. Yeah. It's amazing. It's remarkable. Um, and and we'll, we'll, I'll highlight several instances of that, but the first is just the active, energetic, initiative taking, um, hospitality. Yeah. And I love this statement that she makes really quickly on the, the, this, the first full paragraph, the second paragraph down onto it. She says, hardly Hardly. was a prayer uttered before the answer was given. I love it. Like before you call, I will hear you. I just love that. And that her, her, the, and here's, here's those descriptors. So it says among the women who were gathered the well, The courteous manners of one attracted his attention. There was something attractive about her courtesy. As she came from the well, the strangers went to meet her, asking for some water. The stranger came to meet her, asking for some water from the pitcher upon her shoulder. The request received a kindly answer with an offer to draw water for the camels also. A service which it was customary even for the daughters of princes to perform for their father's flocks and herds. Thus, the desired sign was given... The maiden was very beautiful to behold, and her ready courtesy gave evidence of a kind heart. And I love this, and an active, energetic nature. Yeah, I like that too. Sometimes you think of someone who's like super pious, they're like boring or, or like, hmm. you know, it's way too like pious or morose. But she had a very bubbly, energetic nature while being such a kind hearted soul. And, and we've all met these people, right? Just people that. You, you've gone out to eat at a restaurant and the waitress walks up and immediately you're yeah. like, ah, oh, this girl's cool. I like her. Like this dude's yeah. cool. Like yeah. they, they just, there are people that are so good at being helpful. Mm. I, I don't want to sort of pat myself on the back here, but I love helping people. It's one of my very favorite things in the world just to be a mm. blessing. And they've actually done like kind of some fascinating sociological studies and psychological studies where they've shown that there is more joy to be experienced, more personal joy, more personal happiness to be experienced in helping others than in receiving something yourself. Yeah. And when you tap into that, life is, some of the best people I know are people that will go well out of their way to happily, enthusiastically, not begrudgingly, right. not reluctantly, to be a blessing. Yeah. And you get that sense here. Whatever you need, I'm happy Yeah, what do you need? It. Oh, you need some, I mean, think about this. A man needs a drink of water. Okay, how much, I got my water here. Okay, how much water is a man gonna drink? Okay, yeah. that's how much water I'm going to drink before this program is over. Probably something like that. But it's a whole nother level to say, oh, are your camels there? Camels? You ever seen a camel? A camel is huge. Well, how much water does a camel drink? Oh, do your 10 camels need some water? Yeah, I'll get right on that. That's somebody falling over themselves right. to be a blessing. And it tells you immediately about, it's very likely, it's not a surefire indicator, but it's very likely that that is representative of the culture in the home. Right. Yeah, that, yeah, for sure. There, there's there's something special going on. There's something special yeah. going on because he says, hey, do you have a place I can stay? And she's like, are you kidding? We have plenty of fodder. We have mm-hmm. plenty of straw for the camp. We'd love to have you. And yeah. then she runs ahead. I mean, you can just feel it, can't you? Like this guy's already thinking, whoa, this is happening really quick. And this was way easier than I thought it would be. Like, exactly. That all ex- that stress is gone. Exactly. Yeah. The anxiety is disappearing. Um, so... So then he arrives, and I really like this whole thing. There's a lot of formality at the bottom of page 208 um, with the, you know, he's not going to eat. I'm not going to eat. I have something to say. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Have you done much traveling or any traveling in the Middle East? No. Okay. I mean, I've I've not done a lot. I've worked in their refugees just a few weeks ago. But But there is something Mm -hmm. about Middle Eastern culture and Middle Eastern hospitality that's remarkable. Yeah. It's special. I mean, it's proverbial. I was in refugees' apartments in Texas not that long ago from Afghanistan that were some of the sweetest, most hospitable people I'd ever met. They're falling over themselves to to be a blessing to you. Yes. Yeah, I absolutely love that. And so he says, hey, thank you for this meal. 
you know, because this is exciting. You know, yeah. somebody somebody with 10 camels and already your sister's got all this jewelry on and this big ring in her nose. And you're like, man, this guy means business. <laughs> so this guy's, yeah. like, let's be straight. This guy's a high roller. Right. Now, this guy's rolling up. He's got his camels. They're laden with goods. Mm -hmm. And so you throw this big feast for him. And he says, yeah, just before we eat, I need to tell you why I'm here. I mean, I like that. Yeah. This guy's on a mission. He's driven. And let that be a lesson to us. Yeah, and the thing is, like, he was so concerned that he'd not mess things up and things go well. Once he sees it's going well, like, I nothing else matters. Cor Ooh. Like, I just have to seal it. Like, bury like the treasure that. by the field. Like, now's the time. Take it and do something. Because when you have such a big prayer and it's answered so profoundly, like, you're not going to sit around for a few weeks and think, ah, maybe I'll think about doing something about it. Are you yeah. kidding? It like, was just, right it now, was, It was bubbling out of him. him. Yeah. So he tells the story. Yeah. He literally tells them, well, uh, let me tell you what's going on here. You know, Abraham, and of course they know who Abraham is. Right. Uncle and Abe. I prayed, and and then she came out, and the camels thing. I mean, he's literally telling the story. And Rebecca's listening in. The whole family's listening in. And they're all getting the increasing and decided impression, hey, this is from the Lord. Yeah, this isn't this is a This is a God thing mm. right now. And uh, so then he says, now if you will deal kindly... Mm. Uh, and truly with my master, just let me know. And if not, tell me that I may turn to the right hand or the left. I love that he's making it clear this isn't my idea. God is leading and I'm here on behalf oh, of Abraham. great point. And, and he really, yeah. he's there on behalf of Abraham's God. Right. Right? He's like, hey, yeah. this isn't really about me. This yeah. isn't about my expertise. Or It's kind of got that, you know, that feel of Daniel when he's before yeah. Nebuchadnezzar. He's like, look, this isn't really about my wisdom, my right. smarts, or anything. There's a God in heaven that's, that's right. doing this thing right now. And so he's saying, any kindness you're showing me, you're really showing to the one who sent me. Mm. And Love I it. think that's, that's he's again, just, I don't take credit for this, but like anything you're doing for me, anything you're listening to, this is bigger than us. Right. Yeah. So top of page 209, it says, after the consent of the family had been obtained, Rebecca herself was consulted as to whether she would go such a great distance from her father's house to marry the son of Abraham, mm. she believed from what had taken place. She's been listening in. She knows the story that God had selected her to be Isaac's wife. And she said, and this is the second significant mm. point of very Abraham-like yes. characteristics. She says, I will go. go. Yeah. I will go. Well, that's the very thing that Abraham did, that's right? Get out of your country from your father's house to a land that I will show you. Yeah. She's not familiar with this land. She is now in not an identical way, but in an analogous way, following the providences of God. Back to Canaan. Back to Canaan. Yeah. No, Beautiful. It's, it's absolutely true. And I love what they say. They say, we can't say anything against this. Yeah. Like, we can't speak to either good or bad. This thing comes from the Lord. It's so clear to them. I love that. And and it, it oh. it's another indicator, and I'll get back to this, you know, toward the end of the program here, I'll, I'll walk you through my sort of seven points here. But it's yet another indicator that this is not, as it sometimes you know, the caricature that's painted, an oppressive patriarchy mm. where the, the you know, the men, in fact, in the whole dialogue, where the, where the, where the men have all the control and the, and the women basically, they're just pieces on, the, on the, the chessboard. In the whole dialogue, the father of um, Rebecca, I think his name is Bethuel, yeah. he says nothing. Yeah. He, he basically, this is a conversation. He's the one that's, she's the one that basically at the end of the day says, yeah, I'll go. I'm yeah. happy to go. I mean, I'm not, maybe he says one word or something, but he's he's not presented as this like, you know, overbearing. Well, what I say, this is my daughter. Like I want, no, like it, it says here, it's verse 50. Laban and Bethuel answered and said, so the men of the house, they say, the thing comes from the Lord. We can't speak to you either bad or good. They're the ones that say it. That's it. Here she is, take her. Mm -hmm. Not who are you? What are you about? Like, I need more information. How far is this? Like, it didn't matter. He gives very brief comments. And that's all you hear from him. That's right. I think that's it. And the final, the the whole narrative builds to this idea that Rebecca makes the decision. Yes. Rebecca, again, with Abraham-like faith, yeah. decides to follow the providences of Yahweh, I like your point, back to Canaan, a yeah. long way away, into the unknown. Yeah. And so that was really, really good. I like that. I love the very first sentence on the, uh, the next paragraph, the second on 209. The servant, anticipating his oh, master's I love joy this. I love at this. the success of this mission, was impatient to be gone. And I just love this idea. I mean, I just think about like even in a missional, like evangelistic sense, like what drives you and gets you so excited is the joy that your master will find in now. what happens. Come on now. I just love that Beautiful. so much. And it's it, it's hard not to feel a little 
sorrowful, a little sad here for Rebecca's parents. Like this guy shows up. Okay, let's say it's a That's, Monday. We weren't planning The guy this. shows up on a Monday. You yeah. have the dinner, you have the meal. And he's like, hey, I'd really like to get out of here by tomorrow morning. And they're like, tomorrow, what? But our daughter was, and now you're hundreds no, of miles. So I mean, it's so true. Yeah. But here again, the spirit of God had moved. Everybody yeah. was persuaded this was a providential thing. And I just want to say this, without, without building too high a bar, in your, you're a single person. D, you're a single person. We have single people that are li listening in. When you are finding a prospective spouse, a, so, a partner, somebody to join your life with and for your family to join with their family, hopefully, if you have godly parents on both sides, I don't want to set the bar too high, but I do want to say, you know, <laughs> it doesn't have to follow this exact template, but to say there should be some providential indications. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't just say, oh yeah, there's chemistry and I really like him and she's really cute, you know, full stop, end of story. Oh, no, 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 no. Where's God in the equation? Th yeah, exactly. Yeah. There should yeah. be some detectable, tangible, and yeah. if we had time, I, I could I could bore you with the story of Violetta and I coming to, I mean, boring, actually. It's one of the greatest stories of my life and there is no yeah. doubt. In fact, I will just tell you one detail of it. It's a true story. I didn't know Violetta. Oh, here we go. I'll make this extremely quick. I didn't know Violetta, but I knew her family. And I had seen a picture of her, and she has two brothers and two sisters, just like I have two brothers and two sisters. And I had asked uh, her brother, one of my friends, about her. I said, what about, you know, your younger sister here? Well, she has a boyfriend at the time. She had a man that was a young man that was interested in her. And months later, I was literally praying, because I was a young minister and was considering going into pastoral ministry full time. And I was praying and I said, God, I would love to just meet a godly wife. You can lead, you can guide. And I was like 26 years old at the time and 25, 26. And, and I had Violetta's name come into my mind. I'd never met her. I only knew her family and I hadn't thought about her for months. I hadn't seen that picture for six months. Yeah. And literally into my mind comes the name of a person I'd never met. And I was like, that's weird. I literally thought it was just my brain playing tricks on me. I was like, oh, that was funny. The next day, in the very same time, in the very same place in my prayer, I pray the same prayer and I get this, this sense that Violetta, uh, Violetta Mandachi, and I was like, well, that's weird, two days in a row. That's uncanny, you know, that's unusual. What a coincidence. The next day, I'm having my devotions and in the same time, in the same place, in my prayer, I get the conviction again. And I was like, this is from the Lord. I just had the sense three times Right, this is like Samuel, right? Three times. Right. This is like from the Lord. So I called up her brother, Eugene, and I said, Eugene, I've had the weirdest thing happen three days in a row, and that set in, in motion a series of events that I, that I won't go into, but I had this sense that God was providentially opening doors, and then a couple more doors opened up in such a way that when it finally came time for Violet and I, June 6th, uh, that's my conversion date, June 6th, yeah. 1996, yeah. but April 4th, 1999, to, to wed... It was not just like, oh yeah, he's a cool guy. Oh, she's really cute. We knew, mm -hmm. we knew that God had led us to that place. And here we are almost 25 years later and we just have indication after indication after indication after indication that God was in that. Yeah. So my, my strong encouragement to you as you're seeking for a prospective spouse or if you have children, encourage them to look yeah. for those providential indications that this is not just a man-made thing right. that you can say, as Bethuel and, and Laban did here, hey, this is a God thing. That's right. Uh, who are we to, to venture an opinion on this? God is doing this. Yeah. So anyway, just really important to me that we note that. You got anything, Dee? That's great. That's amazing. It's a good story. Okay, so then uh, 209, she gets kind of back. In, oh, okay, so they we should probably back. tell the story. They yeah. go back. Yeah. And this is told with, you know... Here's what he's doing. Yeah, go, go, go. Um, he's out meditating in the field in the evening. Um, and I'll just read the, the whole part of the paragraph. Yeah, read so it. The, the servant was anticipating his master's joy. This is 209, the first full paragraph. This, actually, the second paragraph. He was anticipating his master's joy at the success of his mission. He was impatient to be gone, and with the morning they set out on their homeward journey. Abraham dwelt at Beersheba, and Isaac, who had been attending to the flocks in the adjoining country, mm. had returned to his father's tent, to await the arrival of the messenger from Haran. Yeah. So he he doesn't he's trusting that whatever's going to come back is going to be what God wants for me, and so he 
um, lifts his eyes, or he, he's meditating in the evening. He lifts his eyes and looked, and there the camels were coming. Then Rebekah lifted her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from her camel, for she had said to the servant, Who is this man walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, It is my master. So she took a veil and covered herself, and the servant told Isaac There's all the There's that formality things. again. Same thing. Here's all of what God did to get us to this point. And then Isaac brought and She her. would have been overhearing this. Yeah. Yeah, you, you get the sense that that happened right then. It's right in front of him, yeah. And so, like, for the... So she has heard the story and is ruminating over it, and she gets to see his reaction to hearing this story. Beautiful. And um, so then he brought her into his mother Sarah's tent, and he took Rebecca, and she became his wife. And he loved her. I love that. And uh, yeah, it was really, really important. He didn't just receive her. I wrote this down. He didn't just receive her. He loved her. Exactly. And, uh, ooh, got a little tinglys there. Okay, and, come on now. <laughs> um, so a little romance in the room. Woo! So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. And I love that, that, that there's, there's an emptiness of maternal care in his life yeah, totally. and that God provides someone to meet that kind of female love need in his experience. And that this, this comforts, this, this fills that place in a way that uh, is just so special. In the opening paragraph, she says, she gives us a little insight into kind of his personality and his yeah. character. She says, um, the young man's affections were strong and he was gentle and yielding in disposition. Yeah. That tells me that he had the strong impress of his mother on him. Yeah. So the absence of his mother would have been felt keenly and yes. acutely. And here, this wonderful, attractive, and, and I just want to say something yeah. about that. She's not only externally, the Bible says she was beautiful to look right. at, but, but remember the thing that made her attractive. All attractive yeah. means is to draw. Yeah. Right. What was the thing that originally drew the eyes of Eliezer? Well, Eliezer is not on the prowl. He's not looking right. for just you know, features and symmetry and shape, he's looking for something else. And the thing that attracted Eliezer to her was her kindness, her energetic, yes. helpful spirit, her courtesy, her hospitality. And so she's beautiful on the outside yes. and she's beautiful on the inside. Yes. And he just sees this girl. And I actually like just how stark the narrative is. Hmm. He hears the story, verse 67, and this is obviously the climax of the whole chapter, then Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent, and he took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. I mean, surely there was a feast, and there was a ceremony, and there was all that. But the, the, the writer, Moses, just wants you to know that God was in this, that Eliezer saw it, that we assume Abraham's not mentioned here in the narrative, but Abraham sees it, Isaac sees it, Rebekah sees it. This is a thing that God is doing, and they get to start this beautiful yeah. life together. And I can't wait to get to the very end. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to hold I, my punchline a little bit. Um, a, a line that came to mind for me through this whole journey for her when she makes the journey and for him when he receives her is that they don't know where this is going, but they know that God's leading and that's enough. Great point. And I just really appreciate it. No, that. absolutely. And it, that's very Abrahamic in nature again, as we talked about. Um, she then goes into a couple paragraphs where she talks about um, Ishmael. Yeah. And the influence of Ishmael's the, wives. And do you know what I wrote at the top of page 210? Let me just read you this because I said something the other day and I wonder if many of you heard that for the first time. So I'm going to start uh, right at the bottom of page 209, 174 yeah. of the original. Listen to this. Uh, I'm actually going to read that whole paragraph. Yeah. Abraham's early teachings had not been without effect upon Ishmael, but the influence of his wives resulted in establishing idolatry in his family. Now listen to this. Yeah. Separated from his father and embittered by the strife and contention of a home destitute, destitute of, of love, love and fear of God, Ishmael was driven to choose. You know what I wrote in my, look what I wrote here. I wrote victim. Yeah. Ishmael's a victim in every time yeah. you turn around, Ishmael's yeah. getting the short end of the stick. Yeah. A home destitute of love. Yeah. This is a radically different experience than Isaac is having. Yeah. Sadly and tragically. Yeah. And destitute specifically of the love and fear of God. Like, yes. you know, a home in which the love of God is present is a place you want to be. It's a piece of heaven on earth. And White talks about That's right. She says he, that here. He doesn't have that. Like, he has nothing of the sorts. Mm -mm. It's just a place. Yeah. It's, it's a physical terrible. structure where people that I'm married to live. And, oh, yeah, it's so true. I like the fact that in that paragraph, she says that in his latter days, speaking of Ishmael, yeah. he repented of his evil ways and returned to his father's God. Amen. Hallelujah, yes. sweet Jesus. Think about this, my friends. You and I, if mm -hmm. we put our faith in Jesus and trust in his faithfulness, 
we are going to meet Ishmael. Mm. Of all the stories that are going to be incredible to hear, Solomon's story, Moses' story, Paul's story, there's Peter's story. I tell you, Ishmael's got to be high on that list. Yeah. I mean, what an experience this young man had. And for him, through all the adversity and all the difficulty and all the sadness and all the rejection and all the brokenness, yeah. for him to come back to his father's God, yeah. man, I, I, that's going to be a... I can't wait to meet him. I think it's going to yeah. be phenomenal. She says, the stamp of character given to his posterity remained. That Abraham, no matter what he encountered, there was still a root structure that just wasn't going to be taken yeah, out. Beautiful. I love that. It reminds you of um, that train up a child in the way he should go. That's it. Should go. In the bottom of that paragraph, she says, the powerful nation descended from him were turbulent, heathen people who were ever an annoyance and affliction to the descendants of Isaac. And it reminds me of Lot's children. Yeah. They're the descendants of Lot. Again, it's And repeating. then she talks about Lot in the next paragraph. Yeah. And this is huge. I yeah. Put, I put, whoa. Just yeah. Kind of little, Unpack little it for us. The wife of Lot was a selfish, irreligious woman. And her influence was exerted to separate her husband from Abraham. So that source of goodness for him. But for her, Lot, but for her, except for her, Lot would not have remained in Sodom. He wouldn't have stayed were it not for her. The ironic thing is the reason why she tarries is because of him. It's crazy. It's just, it's just so I, nice. I just can't get over that fact that she, she says that it was to separate her husband from Abraham. That is so interesting. Yeah. I don't like. Almost, I don't like him. I don't like what he's like. And it, you, yes, yeah, get away and it almost from gives him. you the sense that Lot didn't want to separate. Yeah. You know, at some level that he wanted to be at least proximate enough to Abraham, his counsel, his wisdom, yeah. his insight. She's like, no, I don't like him. He's. And here again, this yeah. is in direct contrast with Isaac and Rebecca's marriage, which is led by God, which is yeah. blessed by God, which has all the providential indications in it. And I'll just throw in this quotation here that I read years ago from the pen of Ellen White, and she said, "Many will trace." the success or failure of their mm -hmm. lives to their wedding day. Wow. The success or the failure of your life. He's like, okay, is this person going to have an ultimately successful life or a fit? And then what? Well, let's look at their wedding day. And you just trace, you trace it all the way back. And you say, oh, yeah, that man's success, that woman's success mm -hmm. started, in my case, April 4th, 1999. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can literally trace the, the ministry that I have right now. I would never have without Violetta. No way. The sons that I have, mm -hmm. I mean... The, 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 the character that my two boys have, the love that they have for Jesus, the love they have for, my, for, for their parents and for our, our parents is like largely, massively, overwhelmingly due to Violetta's influence. Mm. But there are others, and unfortunately, a lot of these people have sat in my office. I've had a lot of these kinds of people in my office, and you just trace the sad story back. And it comes down to an impulsive marriage, yeah. an, un an unwise decision, uh, a pre-marital uh, pregnancy, and then the wheels come off quickly. It can yeah. happen. And so that same sentence, she says, but for her, Lot would not have remained in Sodom, deprived of the counsel of the wise, yeah, God-fearing patriarch. Correct. The influence of his wife and the association of that wicked city would have led him to apostatize from God, again, had it not been for the faithful instruction he had early received from Abraham. And again, this has to give so much hope that Amen. That if you're pouring this effort in, no matter what the world and the devil himself is throwing at them, there's something there that God can work with. Amen. And he can water that seed. He can. And so the marriage of Lot and his choice of Sodom for a home were the first links in a chain of events fraught with evil to the world for many generations. And again, it reminds <laughs> me of this quote. I mean, what do you say with that? And it reminds me again of that quote, Faith of Works 45. When God lets man have his own way, it's the darkest hour of his life. Every time you quote that, I think of Proverbs 14, 12. There's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is death. It seems That's like it. it's the right way. Yeah. Now, I have to read a large section of the next paragraph. Can you read the first sentence? Yeah, I'll, I'll read the whole thing. I'll place a request. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, gotcha. No one who fears God can without danger connect himself with one who fears him not. Oh, That's great writing, by the way. That's a sniper shot. And, yeah. and it's just such good writing. She's yes. such a great writer and yes. communicator. Let's read it again. No one who fears God can, without danger, connect himself with one who fears him not. Yeah. Then quotes Amos 3.3. 3. Yeah. Can two walk together unless they are agreed? The happiness and prosperity of the marriage relation depends upon the unity of the parties. Mm. But between the believer and the unbeliever, and she's exactly right about this, yeah. there is a radical difference of yes. what? Tastes, inclinations, and purposes. I would say morals as well. Uh, oh yeah. man, that's just yeah. a short list of yeah. a much larger list. They are serving two masters between whom there can be no concord. 
However pure and correct one's principles may be, the influence of an unbelieving companion will have a tendency to lead away from God. And this reminds me of the issue that got Lot in trouble, and we talked about this earlier, that this, this kind of arrogant assumption that I can handle it, right? right? Like, I can win them. You know, like, I like them. They're they're pretty. He's a good dude. She's pretty. They're going somewhere. And, like, I know they don't believe right now. We have now. chemistry, the ever-powerful yeah. yeah. chemistry. And I know they don't believe right now, but if you just give me some time, I think I can really make this happen. She's saying it doesn't work that way. Those, those are exceptions are and exceptions. rare exceptions. But, but I love yeah. what she says. The next paragraph provides this incredible counterbalance. Here's what she says. If you're in a marriage yes. and you are converted, you become a follower of the true God, the mm -hmm. creator God. She says you're under a stronger obligation yes. to stay in that marriage and to be a blessing to your unbelieving spouse because by your, and this is the point that Paul makes later in uh, 1 Corinthians, yeah, by your Paul. belief, your spouse could become persuaded. Yeah. And so I like the balance there. She's yes. saying, look, here's the ideal. And, and listen, this is what we're always dealing with in life. You're dealing with something between the ideal and the actual. Yeah. And, and hopefully the ideal and the actual are one and the same, mm -hmm. right? As, as with Isaac and Rebecca. Yeah. Here's the ideal. Here's the actual. One and the same. They're synonymous. But life is not always like that. Sometimes we have the ideal and then we get the actual. And between the ideal and the actual, God still calls us to faithfulness, mm -hmm. right? The fact that we didn't make an ideal decision that we didn't optimally follow God in, in a certain circumstance doesn't then remove from us the responsibility and the obligation to honor God and to prioritize him yeah. and believe that God can bring good out of bad and, and he can give us beauty for ashes. And though you may feel like a spiritual single, you have, you know, a heavenly father who's willing to help you in this, that you're in the majority, not the minority. God wants them in the kingdom is just as far more than you ever could want them in the kingdom. And you're not alone in that situation. Yeah, P. O'Connell just said yeah. on the uh, on the chat here, I think it was P. O'Connell, let me just look there. Yeah, P. O'Connell 85 says, I wish I could do my choices over. And yeah. Some, yeah, who doesn't, Yeah. right? Like who doesn't have significant regrets mm -hmm. about, oh, I, I wish I hadn't, I wish I had, I wish I could have, I wish I would have. Um, true, true enough. But, but God is bigger than our bad decisions. Yes. You know, God can work with, he loves the plan A, but he can work with B. God can work with plan C. God can work with your plan D. God can work with your plan E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. All right? Yeah. We don't always get the optimal. We sometimes get stuck with the actual because of our bad decisions and our impulsive mm -hmm. choices, like we just read about Ishmael. His whole life was a giant mess. His descendants ended up being a giant mess. But at the end, yeah. he made right. Yeah. Beautiful. Amen. Um, do you want next to read that page paragraph? there? No, no, go ahead. Go no, ahead. That was no, that's fine. Comment? I think that's fine. Um, the next paragraph on the next page, 211. Isaac was highly honored by God in being made inheritor of the promises through which the world was to be blessed. Yet when he was 40 years of age, he submitted to his father's judgment. He's a 40-year-old man with hair on his face. Yeah. Right? And, and he's submitting to his father's judgment and appointing his experienced God-fearing servant to choose a wife for him. And the result of that marriage as presented in the scriptures, is a tender and beautiful picture of domestic happiness. Beautiful. And so, so D, by, by, by the Isaac and uh, Abraham standards, you got years. I've got, I got you've yeah. got years yeah. and you've got hair on your face. That's true. You got plenty of time. We just need <laughs> to find you a 10 camel woman. <laughs> Lord, pray oh. that, uh, join us in prayer that, that that 10 camel Rebecca is out there. We know she is. Um, okay, then the next paragraph, or is it one or two paragraphs, she really gets into the importance of trusting and leaning into godly parents. Yeah, in a village, yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. To, to I mean, I know, this will sound crazy, but in many ways, not in all ways, but in many ways, I know my sons, my 19 and 20 year old sons, better than they know themselves. Right. Right, and I love my sons, my sons love me, they love their mother, their mother loves them, and they know that we want their happiness at least as much as they want it for themselves. And yeah. that'll sound crazy to you unless you have children. If you have children, you know exactly that what I'm saying is true. You want your children's happiness more than they want their own happiness. Yeah. This is why a godly daughter or a godly son will defer at some level or at least invite the contribution of godly parents into this conversation. And there's a big difference between control and contribution. I'm not looking for control. Right. I've never controlled my boys, uh, apart from when they were very young and they would be naughty, you know, under the age of five, and you have to just sort of do with them what they don't want done to them, yeah. right? But since those early, early years, I'm not out to control my sons. Mm -hmm. 
But do I want a, a, a contributing voice? Do I? Of course I do. And hallelujah, both Landon and Jabel long for my contribution. Mm -hmm. They want my input. They Amen. want Violetta's input. And this is not now a tug of war between, well, I really like him, but my parents hate him. Mm. We're Team Asherick, yeah. and we're looking for that 10 camel woman for both of our boys. And I'll just throw this out there. I've been talking to my sons about the kind of woman that they would like to be married to someday. I said, you should be looking for this person when you're 16, 17, 18. You're not gonna get married when you're that young, very likely, but you should be looking for the kind of person that you think you would want to marry. So that when you get into your early 20s, you're, what are you waiting for? I'm a big believer, if at all possible, and it doesn't happen in every case. And I recognize that God's providences and, and ways lead different people differently. But I have it strongly advised my boys, look for a girl that will water your dog, buddy. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> I've strongly ad advised my boys to try to be married in your early 20s, yeah. if possible. Um, and be looking in your late teens so that you know, hey, this is what I'm, not dating, I didn't say that, I said looking. Looking, and uh, happily right now, our oldest son has his first girlfriend, she's amazing. I like her at least as much as Landon so far. <laughs> and uh, there's just this incredible camaraderie between the two of them and between our family and her family. Mm. And it's all Amen. going swimmingly well. We don't know exactly what's gonna come of it, but as of right now, uh, I couldn't be prouder of the way that the two of them are handling their relationship. The families are getting together. The families are in communication. And it's awesome. It's beautiful. I, I want to talk about this, this topic of happiness. Ellen White makes a statement in Steps to Christ that all of heaven is interested in the happiness of man. Mm. And I think that's so important because when we don't trust that God actually wants our happiness, we're less inclined to let him into this equation. 100%. And so Abraham had shown kindness and his desire for Isaac's happiness so much that when this time came, it was easy for Isaac to trust him. Exactly. And that Abraham's God had given that same type of witness and example. And so he was doubly confident yes. that his earthly father and his heavenly father were deeply invested in his happiness on this earth. I love it. In the happiness of his future children, because if you're not happy with your spouse, your children aren't gonna be happy, mm. right? So if God gives yeah, you a situation right. that's gonna to lead to happiness, it won't just be for you, it will be to those around you as well. Yeah, one of the great lines that she says is that Isaac's deference to his father's judgment was the result of the training that had taught him to love a life of obedience. Yes. Think about that, to love a life of obedience. And then check this out. This is an important word that's come up over and again mm up to this point in Patriarchs and Prophets. And by the way, we're, we're into the 200s now. Like this, this book is a big book, it's a long book, and it's flying by, honestly. Mm -hmm. While Abraham required his children to respect parent, parental authority, his daily life testified that authority was not a selfish yes. or arbitrary control, but was founded in love and had their welfare and happiness in view. She underline that. that. She keeps saying that. You have to underline that. I mean, yes. that has all the right words. Selfish, arbitrary control as contrasted with Founded in love, their welfare, their happiness. This is the this is really right at the the center of the charge against God's government yeah. that it's selfish, that it's arbitrary, and that it's not rooted in anything. So when it comes time for Isaac to be married, he has implicit trust in his father's counsel and wisdom because he knows that his father desires his own happiness at least as much as he desires his own happiness. And we've already said he trusted his life to his dad, yeah. atop Mount Moriah. Why wouldn't he here trust this situation to him? That's I mean, the, right. the relationship here is so beautiful. And I, I just want to say, mm -hmm. I'm so happy because I my father abandoned me. I never met my biological father. And one of the things I decided early on was that if I ever became a dad, I was just going to be the best possible dad. I was just going to pour myself into my children and God has been so gracious to give Violet and I two sons, and it is not an exaggeration to say, my two boys are two of my closest friends. Violetta and my two boys are my closest friends on the earth. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm not, I don't doubt for a moment that the, that the boys would say the same thing about their parents. And I've seen it. I'm staying in your home. Like I see it. You talk to each other, you right. pray together, you love each other. Jable comes downstairs, I wrestle JJ. him. Yeah, exactly. Yes. No, but just, you know, land and FaceTiming and other things, like it's clear this isn't, this isn't a show, like this is actually happening. It's because God honored that desire of your heart Amen. because it's a desire of his heart. 
Amen. God wants you to be happy. Amen. He wants your wife and your children to be happy. Yeah, and she's he's giving it to you. She has that great line there where she says, parents should never lose sight of their own responsibility for the future happiness of their children. Ugh. I don't know how that's something I could ever lose sight of. Right. I, I wake up and I think more about my, at this point in my life, 49 years old, I spend more time thinking about my son's needs, my son's happiness than I do my own. And someday I'm looking forward to being more concerned about my son's son's happiness. <laughs> Can't wait. Okay, what else you got? We're on the last page. Uh, so this is beautiful. This whole page is so beautiful. Oh, yeah, it's just, so beautiful. Just good. Uh, the the fathers and mothers should feel it's their duty to. Uh, this is the second paragraph yeah. on the last page. Fathers and mothers should feel that a duty devolves upon them to guide the affections of the youth that they may be placed upon those who will be suitable companions. Beautiful. They should feel a duty by their own teaching example with the assisting grace of God to so mold the character of the children from their earliest years that they will be pure and noble and will be attracted to the good and true. Yeah, that's right. Not the bad boy, not the one that's got, you know, you whatever. You got it, you got it. Like attracts like and like appreciates like. Beautiful. I love that. So let the love for the truth and purity and goodness be early implanted in the soul and the youth will seek the society of those who possess these characteristics. Amen. And you, you've talked about this as far as your boys pick, making good decisions and who they're with. You know, you go to any one of our school campuses. I've been to 32 of our academies. Yeah. I've been to a bunch of our colleges. You can find what you're looking for. Yeah, Whatever you're true. looking for, you can find it. But if you're looking for good, godly, solid people, it's going to make you a happier person. And yeah. they are there. Um, yeah, beautiful. So she gives this kind of solemn appeal in the next paragraph that let parents seek in their own character I love this. and in their home life to exemplify the love and beneficence of the Heavenly Father. And again, you keep seeing these traces through Abraham. Though he had failures, though he made mistakes, yeah. he strived to be a man who would honor and represent God in his home. And she keeps saying it bore fruit, even in spite of his brokenness and weaknesses. Um, let the home be full of sunshine. That, that, to me, that's the best sentence in the whole chapter. Yeah. That, so that, that is the sentence yes. that is the whole chapter for me. Yes. Let the home be full of sunshine. The, mm -hmm. the, the husband and wife relationship, yes. the parental relationship, the grandparental relationship. I just, I, that's what I want my home. To, I feel like my home is that way. Mm -hmm. I love my home. I love my family. I love mm -hmm. my wife. And my heart really goes out. I know that not everybody has that experience and it breaks my heart. But for me, I want this for my children. Mm -hmm. I have it myself. And she says, let it, let God shine. I just yes. think it's so beautiful. Keep going. She says, this will be worth far more to your children than lands or money. And Hallelujah. that immediately reminded me of Sodom. Well, they're not getting any of that from me. So. <laughs> <laughs> they're going to have to settle for sunshine in my case. <laughs> but what I, it, this immediately draws me back to the chapter on Sodom. That that Lot made a choice to go where you could find the land yes. of the money. Yeah, but it great didn't bring, point. It didn't bring happiness to his home. Yes, his home was a place of discord and a, and a, a wretched mess at the end of the day. So let the home love be kept alive in their hearts that they may look back upon the home of their childhood mm. as a place of peace and happiness next to heaven. Yeah, and and the, I just saw somebody put up on the chat there. I think it was Michelle. She said that her home was so not like that. Mm. I get it in many ways. My childhood was not like that. Now, later, thank the Lord, I ended up with a really great dad, but that, that happened later after my biological father abandoned me. And then my brother's biological father, who was my adoptive father for, father for a while, abandoned both of us. Mm. So I didn't get it right until I got a third dad, and that was like later in my childhood years. And yet, we can reverse these generational curses. Amen. We can say that Amen. what happened to me is not going to happen to my children. What 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 took place in my home is not going to take place in my the home of my children. And, and I'm so sorry for those that have had a different experience, particularly some in the name of God, which makes it even more galling and terrible yeah. that in the name of Jesus, these homes are made unhappy, anything but sunshiny, yeah. anything but loving, anything but mutually encouraging and supportive. And I, I, my heart breaks. But if my heart breaks and Dee's heart breaks, how much more does God's heart break? Yeah. And we can break those generational curses oh, and cycles. Thank God. I want to read the very last sentence. And if you've got anything else, but I, to me, the last sentence is so beautiful. Marriage, instead of being the end of love, will be only its beginning. Amen. Okay, so are you ready for our rubric? Yeah. Okay, now let, just before we do the rubric, what do you got, Alice? Okay, I got my seven points. Oh, so yeah. Alice is here reminding me about my seven points. Okay, so these are points that emerge in Genesis 24 and the surrounding passages that indicate to us that Rebecca is, she's not some pawn to be moved around on a chessboard. She's a formidable, godly, and capable woman. Okay, number one, 
She is presented in the narrative as beautiful inside and out, right? When I say the narrative, I mean in what we've read in Patriarchs and Prophets and also in the uh, uh, Genesis chapter 24. So number one, she's presented as beautiful inside and out. That's uh, Genesis 24, 16. Number two, we've noted, but her faith mirrors Abraham's own faith, mm -hmm. uh, travel to a faraway and unknown land following the providence of God, and she exhibits tremendous initiative and hospitality. Now let me throw in a, a sad part of this story. This is all under number two. Think about how Abraham's own ingenuity and Sarah's ingenuity, hey, we'll do for God what God said he would do for us, and yeah. then what emerges out of that? Ishmael. Yeah. And then what happens? Family was ruptured. It was yeah. a difficulty. Well, Rebecca's going to do that same thing with, with yeah. her sons, right? With, with uh, Jacob and, and Esau. Yeah. She's going to try and intervene and use her own ingenuity to do for God what God could have taken care of in his own time. And it's going to result in, sadly, a, a disappointment mm -hmm. in their home. But at least it gives us an insight that there was... She was an active, energetic, initiative-taking kind of person. Mm. That's number two. Number three. Now, this is quite interesting. Just write this down. Genesis twenty-two twenty-three. 23. In fact, could you read that for me? Genesis twenty-two twenty-two twenty-three. 22, Yeah. And this is going through the genealogy of, among others, Bethuel, yeah. who is the father yeah. of Rebekah. And read it for us. And Bethuel begot Rebekah, these eight milk of board, Nahor, Abraham's brother, his concubine, whose name was Ruma. That's enough. All right. Yeah. That's a, but the point is, notice that that when Bethuel's genealogy is is mentioned, her brother Laban isn't even mentioned, even yeah. though he's a male. Yeah. Right. It says it says Bethuel gave rise to Rebecca, which tells us that Rebecca was a formidable person. Mm. Right. When it, when you're talking about Bethuel's descendants, oh yeah, well that's oh that's the dad of Rebecca. Mm. Oh oh that's Rebecca's dad. That kind of a situation. Okay. Yeah. So that's twenty two twenty three. Number four. Um, Rebecca ultimately chooses to travel with Abraham's trusted servant. Rebecca's own answer and willingness is the climax of that whole narrative. Yeah. Right. When it when it when it finally comes down to it, who makes the final decision? It's Rebecca. Yeah. It's not Bethuel. It's not Laban. It's not her mother. She makes the final decision. Her family knew that she had discernment and good judgment. Correct. And that she was being led by God. Yeah, that's yeah. right. She could be trusted to make this decision. It tells right. you something about the home. Yeah. Um, number five, Rebecca arranges for Abraham's servant's stay and needs with her mother's household. This is in 2428. Remember, she runs ahead and says, yeah. of course, we have plenty of fodder for the camels and, and straw, no problem. Um, in We've already noted this. Uh, in the actual narrative, the, fa the father hardly speaks at all, and the women of the house are presented as intelligent, energetic, and capable. Mm. Okay? Because it actually says quite interesting. There's a t subtle little detail, and I didn't go deep on it, but... Remember that, that Eliezer says, um, let me just read it to you. You, you got your yeah. thing right there. Let me just read this to you. Quite an interesting little subtle thing. Um, Come in, blessed Lord. Why do you stand outside? Okay, this is where, oh, this is where he comes out. We have both straw. No okay, watch this. Watch this. Um, so she said to him, I'm in verse 24, 24, 24. So she said to him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, Milka's son, whom... She bore to Nahor. Moreover, she said to him, we have both straw and feed enough and room to lodge. Then the man bowed down his head and worshiped the Lord and said, blessed be the Lord God of my master, Abraham, who has not forsaken his mercy. Let me go on here. As for me, and I'm being on my way, led me to the house. So the young woman ran and, oh, let's check this out. So the young woman ran and told her mother's household these things. That's fascinating. Yeah. So, so that tells you that she was in a home where the matriarchs, Manage the home, took care of the home. Oh, we have a guest coming over. We have a situation. You don't yeah. just go to the patriarch, the guy who rules over everything and makes all the decisions, you know, in this sort of tyrannical way. She, she went and told her mom, hmm. right? I like that. And then uh, number six here. This is an interesting one. Write down 25, 22. So Genesis 25 and 22 and beyond. During her pregnancy with Jacob and Esau, it says that she inquired of the Lord hmm. and then God speaks directly to her. Now That's that true. language inquired of the Lord is the language of the prophets. Mm -hmm. It'll say that so-and-so inquired of the Lord. This is a woman who had her own connection. She's not a wallflower. Yeah. She's not that's just right. along for the ride. She's invested. And that's my seventh point, seventh and final point. Listen to this. When Esau marries her son Esau to her great sadness and distress, marries two Hittites, the text says that they, the Hittite uh, wives of their son Esau, made life bitter for Isaac and 
and Rebecca. That's 2635. Now, what this tells us is this signifies that she was involved in the running of the house, in the management and welfare of the family, yeah. and that she had significant concern for the family name and for yeah. God's covenant with Abraham. So all yeah. of these put together, the picture that emerges here is that Rebecca was, as I said, a formidable, godly, capable, intelligent woman. Wow. Is that good? Yeah, it's great. You like that? Yeah, okay, I'm, now let's do our rubric. And I have a question. I have yeah, a go. quote on my phone, but it's off stage. Yeah, go grab it. Okay. Go grab like it. Party I'll go ahead and start the Okay, rubric. so we're going to go go down the point, the person, the prayer, the practice, and the promise. And I'll start by saying the point. So here's what I wrote. The point of this chapter is to give us a biblical and beautiful portrait of marriage, love, and family. And then I wrote here, to let the home be full of sunshine. Hmm. Okay. You got a point for us, D? Uh, yes. Uh, the point, who we yoke up with tells us what we will be yoked to. Oh, I like that. Yeah. Who we yoke with is what you are yoked to. That's yes. a great point. Um, okay, what do we learn about the person? What do we learn about God in this chapter? It's a beautiful story. And here's what I wrote. God honors those that honor him. He answers prayer. He leads providentially. Amen. He loves godly marriages and families and blesses them, as it says in Genesis chapter 24, verse 1, in every way. Hmm. I love that. Yeah. It says, Abraham was old and God had blessed him in every way. God wants to bless you in every way. He hmm. wants to bless you physically, financially, maritally, parentally, uh, psychologically, emotionally. There's not yes. one way that God doesn't want to bless you. Yes. Okay, what do you got? Jesus truly desires our happiness and our familial prosperity. And, um, and on that point, this is a quote that came to mind when you were talking yeah. about if you grew up in less than ideal environments or whatever. This is from Review and Herald, April 13, 1897. It's also an Adventist home, 206.1. Even if the character, habits, and practices of parents have been cast in an inferior mold, hmm. if the lessons given them in childhood and youth have led to an unhappy development of character, they need not despair. Hallelujah. The converting power of God can transform inherited and cultivated tendencies for the religion of Jesus is uplifting. Hallelujah. Born again means a transformation, a transformation, a new birth in Christ Jesus. And I love this. You're talking about tearing down strongholds. We're given that very promise that no matter what the upbringing may have been, but wasn't ideal, the converting power of God can transform Amen. inherited and cultivated tendencies. He can restore the years that the locusts have oh, eaten. I mean, God. God is in the business yes. of taking... People in difficult and, I mean, Abraham himself is an example. Yeah. He was not from an optimal situation. Yeah. In fact, it, one of the things she makes in the paragraph, we didn't point this out, but she says that that when Abraham had the idea to go back to his own people in the land of Mesopotamia, she says that they were not, they had not fully given up their idols, yeah. but they did serve Yahweh. Yeah. So Abraham did not come in an out of an optimal situation, but he by the power of the Holy Spirit yes. and by the goodness of God was able to just create a totally different situation. That's and we right. can do the same. Yeah. Um, okay, you lead uh, D with prayer. How do we pray this chapter? Well, I mean, I get, this is kind of contextualized as like, do, okay. I, do I open up my prayer closet for everybody or is yeah, there a general yeah, yeah. prayer for us? Let, let us know about the uh, prayer for the <laughs> tell, 10 tell camel us, woman. Tell us the goods. Lord, give me that 10 camel lady. Um, no, I, I think I think for me, just the, the prayer is that I, I want my decision-making process to be as God-honoring as possible. Like, God, I want this to be something that honors you and that the end result in the fruit of my marriage would be everything that you intend for it to be. Ooh. Yeah. Well said. I wrote, Father, please may my two sons find godly wives and be godly husbands. May their homes be filled with love, sunshine, and children. A nine dog lady. <laughs> <laughs> the last thing D oh, needs is eight more dogs. No idea. Buddy's enough. Yeah, yeah. Mm. We, we just need to find you a wife. That's what we're, we're, we're working. We're we working. think we're heading in the right direction. We're praying. Okay, the practice. What you got? Uh, this is an area where we absolutely need, uh, cannot settle or rely on our own wisdom. Um, and we need to lean into God and those counselors that he's put into our lives. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. I like that. That God speaks to us in a multitude of counselors. Yeah. And you keep making the point about a village or a yeah. community. It's not only a family. Some people don't have godly parents. Right, exactly. Well, lean on those mentors and others in your community of faith and 
ask them if they see what you see. Yeah. Do do if and if they have concerns, right. you know, you might have to humble yourself a little bit and say, "What you do know, you think? What do you think of this person?" Does that's this, right. You know me. What do you think about this situation? Yeah. When when yeah. when the current um, Landon's girlfriend that he has right now, who's absolutely wonderful, whose praises I've been singing, when he first expressed an, an interest in her, he was still in Australia. And he said, hey, dad, you're going to be at this speaking appointment in this, you know, on this certain date. And she's in that area. He said to me, can you suss her out? So he said, check her out. Go, go see what you think of her. Like literally he's saying to me, hey, I'm not there. Let me know what you think. He, he cared deeply to know. Actually, it ended up working out. I was like, well, how about this? Let's, I'll do you one better. How about I fly you back from Australia? This was my trick all along because I wanted him back in Australia, from Australia. I flew him over here and I said, you, you can come and we'll suss her out together. And that's what ended up happening. Amen. And they've hardly been out of one another's presence <laughs> since that day. And I, I, I'm fine with it. I love yeah. it. So here's what I wrote. How do we practice this chapter? Again, this is coming from my situation with two sons, 120, 119. I wrote, I want to play a contributing, but never a controlling role mm. in my children's lives and in their choices, Amen. including but not limited to their choice of a spouse. Amen. And I think that's what God wants to do with us. He wants to make a contributing, but not a controlling role in our decision-making. Yeah. Set. Okay, finally, the promise. Uh, if we trust his guiding and the village that he gives us, we will have his blessings on our union and it will be a place of happiness. That's the promise we're given. Uh, my promise was the last sentence of the chapter. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Marriage, instead of being the end of love, will be only its beginning. And as somebody who's about getting close to 25 years deep into my marriage with Violetta, it is, uh, as, as Alice and Reiner said, who are sitting in our room here, 42 years in their case, of almost 25 bliss. years in mine of marital bliss. And um, D, let's see what everybody's words were. Is that your word? Sunshine. sunshine. Oh, that's my word. Hey. Alice and I have the same word, and that word is sunshine. sunshine. Hey, Reiner, you're actually putting your word in. So you're, you're following <laughs> and you're in the room. Is that happening? <laughs> I love it. Deference. So he deferred because he defers to his parents <laughs> or to his father. I love it. Deference. Happiness. Duty. Trust. Trust is a good one. Trust is another one. Yeah, I like that. Not. Love. Oh, K N O T. Not. Trip the Life Photography says sunshine. That's same with me. Jim says not. The not. Oh, the knot that binds together. Yeah. Good. Gabby Abby says love. Amaro says sunshine. Oh, a lot of sunshines. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Happiness. Guidance. Cassandra says, oh, guidance. Chris, guidance. What's that? Alex uh, Lash says, trust. Sandy Patifer says, like. Oh, deference is another one here. here. Do you go, see Christine. that, Reiner? Yeah. Um, honor, confidence, love, love. See, I couldn't choose love because that was it's, my first it's, word. Yeah, it's too simple. Oh, yeah, it's true. You guidance, are. exemplify. Oh, Hannah says uh, her word was almost sunshine. Hannah, I missed your word. I'm sorry. Put it back up there. Harmonious. Oh, let's see the visitors. Um, oh, they want to see them. Do you want to see the visitors? Unity. They don't want to be seen. <laughs> Agreement. I could turn the phone and, and there, I'll turn the phone so you can see them. You can see them even if they don't want to be seen. Okay, so this is, can you see yourself there? Alice, that's Alice. And Reiner's over there hiding behind that light. <laughs> Reiner, where are you at? Thank you. There you are. You can see his arm. <laughs> that's the arm of my doctor. Uh, let's see, we got beginning, sunshine. Um, heaven. Somebody says, come on, come on. Smiley face, smiley face. Hello, everybody says. Hi, guys. What's People are on? greeting. Well, they're greeting. Oh, they're, uh, oh right got it. Right now. I was like, so confused. You know, the trip was 457 miles. Yeah, I, I thought it was about 500 miles. Yeah, yeah. that was a long trip. Yo. Yeah, Reiner just pointed out that the trip was almost 500 miles. Camels drink, each camel drinks 20 gallons. So a camel apparently can drink 20 gallons. 200 gallons. So if my math is right on that, that's 200 gallons. Plus, plus a glass of water. Exactly. Plus a glass of water. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. So uh, thank you for tuning in. What was your word, D? Yeah. Your word was happiness. How dare you? Am I uh, right? It, it was, can I, I had to slash. I had kindness slash happiness. I wasn't sure which one. I kind of like ah! kindness. Happiness got used so much that it makes perfect sense. But like kindness was that characteristic that she had that I was is endearing. So I don't know which. I, can't <laughs> I guess your words. You're predictable. Yes. Well, let's all give everybody. Uh, let's everybody. Let's give D a big digital uh, round of applause and thank you for coming. Give him a shout out. Woo!
Dee, we're so glad you've come. And uh, when we do the next, whatever it is with DA, you're welcome to join us. We'd love to sure, have you. Sign me up. Um, thank you for coming. We've got more guests coming. We'll be back tomorrow night at uh, same time, same place, 7 p.m. And I'm trying to talk one of these two to come in front of the camera with me. So pr pray that one of them will do it, or maybe both of them. Um, D, would you close with prayer for us? Uh, sure. Okay. Again, Jesus, we just thank you for the lessons you're learning, uh, teaching us. We thank you that you're so desperately interested in our happiness. Amen. And I pray that that would kindle in our own hearts and minds the trust uh, that Isaac showed, the trust that Rebecca showed, and the trust that Abraham and his servant also showed, that you've been mm. so kind and good to us that if we just go where you're leading, happiness will be what we receive, mm. even in the midst of a world of hardship and Hallelujah. difficulty. You have promised happiness in the here and now. We're thankful for that. We pray that you'd forgive our sins, mm. that you'd cover us with the blood of Jesus, mm. and that you would send the Spirit uh, to do in, through, and for us what we're wholly incapable of doing for ourselves. Thank you, Jesus. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We'll see you tomorrow night. Yep. Seven o'clock. Hey, D, there, how? How was it live? It was good. Yeah? It was so good. Can I get one of you guys to come join me at some point or no? <laughs>